Now, you mustn't assume that the traditional banks are, are, are not in the same space. They are very much in the same space. But then there are constraints that the traditional banks have. There's some of the smaller uh, uh, fintech companies, et cetera, uh, may not be uh, constrained or encumbered with. So this is why you have this plurality of uh, players in the industry that are exciting that, that Singapore espouses, and so does UAE as well. The UAE follows, again, a very, very broadly uh, innovative, uh, adaptable financial sector and system that encourages diversity and innovation technological uh, uh, infusion. So thank you, Anson. Uh, last but not least, again, to demonstrate to you that there are other uh, modalities, i.e. here you have in the form of Lulu, uh, a, a company that is a huge uh, conglomerate, well known for its supermarket, hypermarket stores in the UAE, that is moving into the financial space too. And they have opened an office in Singapore. So I pleasure in inviting Joseph to, to introduce himself and, and Lulu. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Brian. And uh, good afternoon, Singapore, and good morning, uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Joseph Cletus. I head the business transformation at Lulu Financial Group. Uh, to give you a brief, as the doctor said, a brief summary of the financial group, I request Ms. Huda to show a quick video on the holdings group, please. Lulu Financial Holdings is an investment holding company incorporated in Abu Dhabi with an objective to invest in financial services and products to improve people's lives. As a holding company to our existing and new investments, Lulu Financial Holdings aims to simplify payment solutions through digital innovation and collaborative synergy with a strong focus on customer experiences. As of today, the existing investments under the holding company include Lulu Forex Private Limited in India, in which we hold 100% stake. Lulu Financial Services, NBFC in India, in which we hold 100% stake. Lulu Exchange Company, LLC in Oman, in which we hold 70% stake. Lulu Money in Philippines, in which we hold 90% stake. Lulu Financial Services Limited in Hong Kong, in which we hold 100% stake. NS Cash Point, SDN BHD in Malaysia, in which we hold 70.83% stake. Mass Express PTE in Singapore, in which we hold 49% stake. Lulu Capital in ADGM, UAE, in which we hold 100% stake. And Pearl Data Direct, in which we hold 100% stake. With a bird's eye view of the business landscape, we at the holding company will be responsible for layering an operational framework that consolidates value for our existing and upcoming investments without involving in their day-to-day -day operations. By shaping strategies on matters related to sector R&D, audit and compliance, critical business decisions and governance. Let's play a more central role towards achieving our mission to enhance value of our investments by designing inspiring customer experiences built on technology and collaborative partnerships. Lulu Financial Holdings. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for that video. And uh, what I would like to do now uh, is to pose specific questions uh, to the panelists and subsequently open up the discussion to participants in the, in, in, the, in the webinar. Let me start off with Pankaj from Bank of Singapore. Pankaj, I mean, Bank of Singapore's successes in wealth management in Asia are, are really unrivaled and, and, and you have a lot to be proud of. But what is obviously uh, another great success story is how you have expanded your, your wealth management operations in the GCC out of Dubai, in DRC, where I'm, I'm told that you even employ more people than UBS, which is something to be to be to be to be to boast of. Now, uh, I understand your your primary model is to attract liquidity to in from the Middle East, GCC in particular, into Singapore and the and, and the Asia Pac region. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, what do you think are the prospects of your Asian clientele 
the Asian clientele that that form your client, your your bulk of your clients expect of viewing the UAE and the GC as a track uh, portfolio investments. Mankaj. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shagar, for that question. No, you're absolutely right. We have a very strong and growing business presence in Dubai. We have a branch in DIFC for providing wealth management services. Dubai is one of the two major hubs, along with Hong Kong, outside of the Singapore head office. So it's a very important uh, base for us. We have 130 people on the ground, including sales, product, compliance, risk, and finance teams. Uh, and we advise on very substantial client assets out of our DIFC office. We continue to invest heavily in developing our Dubai operations with business growing exponentially over the last few years. And we expect the strong growth trends to continue for the foreseeable future. Now, you talked about the client segment and the focus of the business. We actually serve a broad mix of clients from our DIFC branch, uh, including Arabs, Indian diaspora and B2B clients. The amount of sophistication uh, of Middle Eastern wealth has been growing, and we are capturing a fair bit of that business. So that's one. We also see a trend of wealth migration from Europe, which gets served out of Dubai. The Indian diaspora is a very important client segment for us, as we are the leaders for this client segment in the Asian wealth management market. Uh, we not only have a leadership in the NRI business, we also have a market leading and unique initiative to serve the Indian resident clients for meeting their offshore wealth management requirements. We see a very large and growing interest from that business segment. So from wealthy Indian families, we are seeing a lot of interest in migrating uh, to UAE or setting up base in UAE. So that's another very big uh, business segment. And uh, this is actually, if you look at uh, you know prospects, this is a direct result of the very liberal, progressive, and dynamic policies being rolled out by the UAE government. And we think we are still in the very early stages of this trend. We believe this trend will accelerate very significantly over the coming years. We think more Asian investments will flow into UAE assets like property, etc., but also more global investments of these clients from Asia being advised out of the way. In anticipation of these trends, we have developed products for the UAE market specifically, including lending against UAE shares, lending against UAE property. We are also leveraging our market leading partnerships with the largest wealth managers in India to grow the Dubai India corridor significantly. So to sum up, we believe strongly in the potential for exponential growth in both portfolio and business investment flow from Asian clients into UAE. And we continue to invest very heavily in Dubai to take advantage of the structural trend. Excellent, uh, Pankaj. I think it's a very interesting uh, and enlightening response. And I must state that you are well poised, most certainly very well poised, to benefit from that growth potential that you've just alluded to. Uh, I move on now. Thanks, Pankaj. I move on to Arun. Um, Arun, DBS is by far one of the strongest institutional corporate banking institutions in, in Asia. And, 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 you know, we in the USBC, one of our primary objectives is to promote greater investment activity in the UAE among Singapore companies. Now, these companies and investors would, I'm sure, benefit from the strong, uh, from the project financing advice and uh, support from institutions such as yourselves. And you have strengths in these, in these areas. Now, what I would like to ask you is from your experience, you've been, I know, in the, in, in the UAE market for many, many years, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for a couple of decades, uh, and you are very well versed in that, in, that, in that market. From your experience in the UAE and the Middle East, what do you consider to be the key risk factors that you would, could highlight that Singapore companies should be contemplating or focusing on before embarking on UAE projects? Uh, thank you for that question, Brian. And uh, I will maybe just, if you would just allow me to digress a little bit from your question, I would like to look at it at a slightly more holistic level. I'd, I'd like to spend a 
little bit of time talking about the opportunities in the project financing space and then what I perceive as some of the practicalities and the challenges, if I may. So I think the uh, the region has been very, very active in the project finance space. The UAE in particular, I mean, it's been uh, within the GCC, it's been the most uh, active, uh, uh, you know, country country in this particular space. And the opportunities have really come about in three, uh, th three broad segments. I think one is the construction segment, one is the transportation segment, and the, th and the third is the energy segment, the oil and gas, renewables, and, uh, the, you know, uh, broadly, uh, spectrum uh, now the sponsors in all these projects uh, in, in most of these cases uh, tend to be uh, you know uh, uh, gres government owned or government related enterprises and therefore the quality of the sponsor is very very strong and that in turn means that the product the, the uh, projects are extremely competitive you know the bidding process for the project becomes very competitive and therefore the cost of bidding becomes a very very important criterion in determining who gets uh, uh, awarded the final project. So we typically for most of the projects that come around, we see these large consortiums which uh, get together and put forward their bids and uh, financing is clearly a very element, uh, very important element of that bid. Now within the financing uh, the fi financing universe, I think a, a few a few things that I probably just like to make a mention of. I mean, this has traditionally been a market that has been dominated by the banks. Uh, although of late we are seeing uh, we are uh, we are seeing a few uh, transactions where we are increasingly seeing structures such as uh, bridge to bond takeouts and kind of thing, but as we speak, it still continues to be a very uh, bank dominated market. Uh, project finance transactions typically tend to be long tenor, uh, north of uh, the, depending on which industry it is, they could be north of 20 to 25 uh, 25 odd years. And therefore, one of the things that's happening is that the cost of financing is becoming increasingly important because uh, banks' ability to be able to lend for that long at extremely fine rates of interest, which is what the the you know the stature of the sponsor commands. Is, is becoming increasingly challenged. So that's also one of the reasons why we have been seeing a shift on, uh, in some of these projects moving on to uh, more bridge to bond kind of structures. Uh, early days, but I do see this evolving uh, evolving as, as we go down the path in, uh, in the coming years, especially with the demand for the kind of uh, projects that uh, are on the agenda. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, uh, that part, if you were to look at it purely from a project perspective, you know, I guess it is an evolving landscape. Regulations do tend to evolve. Uh, we have seen a few cases where, let's say, the scope of the project does get renegotiated. Uh, as a result of which, this would typically lead to time delays and cost delays and so on and so forth. And we have, uh, we have kind of uh, uh, seen a couple of cases where, uh, you know, uh, the because of these kinds of issues and uh, you know the fact that the sponsors tend to be extremely demanding. Uh, we have we have and we have Envisa, we've seen a couple of cases where the projects have probably extended long beyond what the original game plan was but again in uh, we have not we've not yet come across a situation where there has been a problem eventually it's been kind of uh, resolved so uh, i guess in some uh, some in substance it's a, it's a it's a market that is evolving it will continue to evolve but it is one that presents significant opportunity to uh, companies that are looking to come into this part of the world including companies from singapore uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very comprehensive response that you've given me. And uh, yes, it is very competitive. I fully agree with you. And and Singapore companies who want to be involved in uh, project financing or, or investing in manufacturing facilities in, in that part of the world will have to do their due diligence very thoroughly and, and, and ensure that they've done such a proper due diligence to ensure the, the feasibility and the financial feasibility, particularly of the project, before they approach bankers like yourselves for financing. But I'm very sure your experience and knowledge as DBS uh, uh, and, the, and, and the, the fact that you've been involved in the region for so long, uh, the advice you can give them and the counseling and the you know inputs that you can offer to simple companies who are interested in the UAE will be indeed valuable and and uh, and that's why I felt your participation uh, in this panel is important. Uh, I'm well, thank you. Uh, Aruna. I move on to now uh, Suvana. Suvana, you you obviously uh, are very into trade finance and in particular digitization. Do, and I must tell you that trade flows between Singapore and the UAE is increasing. 
so much so that uh, last year there was a record year actually bilateral uh, trade flows went to up went up to 21 billion dollars which is uh, which is quite quite a uh, which is i think a record figure Part, part of that increase was due to increase in oil price, of course. But the, the trajectory is, 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 is good. Uh, we in the USPC are constantly encouraging Singapore SMEs particularly to explore the potential of the UA market and the GCC. And of course, they will require trade financing facilities. And I just want to ask you is, uh, you know, you gave a very, very um, uh, uh, extensive uh, sort of expose of the uh, digitization uh, happening, digitization process happening, trade finance, will that, can that help facilitate more Singapore companies to do trading, to, to do trade finance or get trade finance and, and, and get support uh, uh, from your banks like yourself uh, because of this interesting innovation and digitization? Is that going to assist the, 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 the financing of international trade or bilateral trade between Singapore and the UAE, in your opinion, Suwana? Absolutely, uh, Brian. As you rightly said, so Singapore and UAE, given their strategic locations and the major hubs of uh, re-export and financial hubs, there's heavy flow of commodities from East to uh, you know Middle East and also Africa regions. And similarly, there's a uh, reverse flow from uh, on the oil and gas from Middle East uh, to Asia Pacific. And with these are all actually heavily uh, paper-based and manual, and then complex cross-border trade transactions are involved. And as you rightly said, to cope up with these spike in the volumes that we have seen post-COVID, certainly the digitization uh, flow will naturally help the trade flows between the Singapore and UAE by reducing the trade cycle times. It will help for the trade activity to uh, enhance between the two larger uh, trade hubs, and especially with these new technologies like blockchain, the e-bills, and, and the um, you know even the national uh, trade networks that are growing up. All these things, I, I believe that significantly will help uh, uh, you know the, both the Singapore-based companies and the UAE uh, companies companies to increase in their trade, trading activities. Well, that's a very encouraging response, Ivana. And we're musing to the ears of our uh, clients or our members, rather, who are uh, participating in this seminar uh, because, you know, uh, getting financing to support the increasing trade flows is, is, is a vital aspect of, uh, of, 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 you know, the business ambitions in the UAE. And if digitization is going to facilitate that, that's welcome news. Uh, thank you, Swana. I now move on to Anson. Anson, you know, uh, you, 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 as I said, represent an interesting uh, emerging but very important sector for the financial sector industry, which is fintech. And, and the UAE has positioned itself as the largest hub for fintech growth in the region. There are so many uh, uh, illustrations I can give you. For example, the Dubai Crown Prince launched a 100 million venture capital fund uh, this year to bolster startups and entrepreneurs in this sector. And, and in 2021, uh, the fintech startups in the UAE received record high uh, levels. There was a 550% growth of funding uh, and deployed into fintech startups. There was a 56% growth in number of uh, fintech startup deals that were closed uh, in, in 2021. And, and fintech accounted for 21% of all venture capital deals and 31% of all venture capital deployed in startups. And of course, 24% of fintechs in the region are based in the UAE. Now, Singapore has established itself already as a major fintech center with total investments of 3.9 billion last year. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, we have a thriving fintech sector in Singapore as well. The question I want to ask you is this. In your opinion, and I know you have been looking at the UAE very closely um, over the past several months uh, in terms of fintech. Uh, what are the attractions that the UAE can offer to Singapore fintech companies that would wish to diversify out of Singapore. And, and I like to suggest that, that Singapore fintech companies should seriously look at the UAE, but you probably would know more. Uh, uh, and I would like to know what are your views on this? Thanks, Dr. Brian. So um, I think one of the main things, main distinctions between Singapore and uh, Dubai, with this said, we will actually understand um, the point that I will respond to. So for example, Singapore right now, um, throughout its history, being a financial center and obviously a, a trade port was key, is key and still key today. 
meaning that it's important for Singapore to protect its uh, financial status, its reputation, its high standards, being on the trying to, trying to be at the top of the top in uh, FedEx's uh, um, uh, non-grade list um, is, is key for, for Singapore, especially because Singapore in terms of reserves, it's one, its own people and monetary reserves, whereas um, uh, UAE, on the other hand, is, uh, has a very mass amount of oil reserves, which they're trying to diversify uh, uh, away, especially, especially Dubai. So by diversifying away also means that there is existing reserves, which um, if just touch wood, if things don't happen in the fintech space, just saying, there's still an industry that uh, Dubai can still uh, rely on. Whereas Singapore, in terms of its financial status, its, uh, its reputation, once, as, as the Prime Minister has said before, we only have one chance. Once that is gone, Singapore is gone. So it's important that its reputation is, uh, is kept. So what that means is that Singapore's standpoint for innovation is that they must protect the banking sector first before there is innovation that can happen. This mindset very differs very, very differently from, from the likes of UK, where fintechs can run like the same as banks, can compete um, equally with each other. Uh, Dubai can also do the same. It's not as very protective relatively to Singapore con of its banking sector. It's more pushing towards innovation, uh, pushing wherever it, uh, whatever it can. So this thing, I think that's where it differs, where Dubai has a lot more room to innovate. However, having said that, uh, especially with the financial uh, uh, space, crypto space, I'll speak more on the crypto side. Uh, it's important to advance innovation, be aggressive, yet be compliant. So uh, when the news for the crypto sector, when Dubai came out with the news that it came, went into the gray list in the uh, FedEx space, um, things started, uh, even though there are companies moving uh, to Dubai, uh, it, the, the, the mindset is, uh, is different. It's not like it's on the same scale, but I'm pretty sure Dubai and UAE will be able to uh, fix that in the, in, the, uh, in the medium term. So um, it's important, unlike uh, Estonia, for example, another example, they were expanding too aggressively. And guess what happened? They started, the companies got hacked. They didn't follow AML regimes. They started removing the licenses and Estonia itself became a problem if the reputation is all wrecked in terms of uh, the crypto licenses. Singapore doesn't want to be that. And I also want to like, it would be great that Dubai also doesn't go into that, that trap of uh, uh, pushing too uh, aggressively. So with, with that said, I can see why Singapore companies will move to Dubai. The, uh, the engagement is definitely as strong as uh, Singapore, yet because of its not needed uh, uh, protection of its financial status compared to Singapore, there's a lot more room to, uh, in, for engagement between the two sectors. Uh, so these are the two main things that I, uh, uh, I see. And I think it's a very uh, good point you make, uh, Anson. And, 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 and Dubai, uh, as, as you said, uh, is very keen to innovate. But I like to think that there is also a strong, uh, uh, a strong commitment to the uh, to the 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 stability of the financial system, the banks are well regulated and supervised, uh, and 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 so I think there is of course this sort of uh, this interesting coexistence that is that has to happen and it is happening, but that is a a, 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 a work in progress, as you rightly say, and is a very interesting uh, sort of a. a uh, you know, a tight rope to walk. Uh, you want to innovate, but you don't want to uh, wreck the uh, stability of the underlying financial system. And I, I think the points you raised are very valid. And and the regulators have to be very, very uh, uh, conscious of 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 especially the financial sector, protecting the financial sector in terms of uh, uh, disruption. A, a, a good, good, good response, Anson. Uh, thank you. I'll move on to. Joseph, uh, Joseph, uh, as I said earlier on, um, you know, it is fascinating to, to see how the Lulu Group, a huge conglomerate in the UAE that is a household name in, 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 in the supermarket, the food distribution chain, now playing an active role 
in the in the, in the financial sector service uh, 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 in the financial sector in terms of what you displayed in your video in different countries including Malaysia and India of course and Singapore now that you've got an operation in Singapore and and what I what I would like to ask you I know you are involved with strategy formulation and all that what prompted your group to sort of move into this into the financial sector and you know it is a competitive sector you know that i more than anybody else uh and 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 so that would be an interesting uh a story for you to sort of briefly very briefly uh tell us and 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 then also about your office in singapore and your plans for the office in singapore in terms of facilitating uh perhaps transaction between singapore and the uae joseph Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. So uh, I'll just uh, follow on the uh, presentation of Ms. Suvarna. Uh, she had mentioned the embedded payments, uh, how the bank is transforming themselves, right? So similar to that, we believe that every business has a potential to be a fintech. And large companies definitely will become a fintech, managing their own treasury, fund management, and even handling of payments, right? And players like Lulu, who serves millions of customers a month, there was a big opportunity to offer this payment solutions to our uh, customers. We have seen the successful stories earlier with players like Walmart, Tesco, offering cross-border or you know, cross-selling uh, financial services to their customers. With this vision, we set up a standalone and independent entity called Lulu Financial Holdings back in 2008. This entity has investments in financial companies worldwide under the brand names Lulu Exchange, Lulu Money, uh, Lulu Capital, and FinServe. Even to build such technologies, we have a standalone entity called Pearl Data Direct that caters to the technology services for the entire group. Now, this Lulu Financial Holdings has no dependency with the Lulu Retail Group. It is standalone. It is regulated in every jurisdiction and follows the regional and local compliance. It has a separate management team that functions. The, now, when it comes to the Singapore, we see Singapore as a service gateway, a launch pad for our service offered as APIs. So in Singapore, we are launching a platform called Digit9 that helps financial institutions and fintechs to enable and quickly launch cross-border remittances to their customers. Now, we have seen when it comes to the traditional B2C offerings, companies that have adopted the mobile first strategy have taken always a huge lead, be it when it comes to e-commerce, marketplaces, and even on the financial services. Now, when it comes to the cross-border payments, we saw a gap there. The traditional MTOs or payment service operators whose support or behind the scenes offer the solutions to this fintechs or, uh, or the uh, B2C players were not ready or designed for mobile. Now, what Digit9 brings us with our a decade old experiences, our learning, we packaged everything for a service consumption, be it building a corresponding relationship, uh, treasury deals, currency conversions, last mile payments, or be it compliance or KYC, we provide everything as a service. We have partnered with innovative players in Singapore and the region to ease up the settlement and the cross-border needs. We are here strongly, and I'm repeatedly saying we are here to enable every business to be a FinTech by providing everything as Thank a service. You. Now, in a summary, the end, it is like the whole Payload is designed and built in UAE, but it is going to take off from the launch, launch pad in Singapore. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much, Joseph. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists, uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, you have answered all the questions very thoroughly, very robustly. I think we all learned a lot from your responses. There are a few questions which we'll respond to separately uh, uh, to the questions that have been posed in the chat group, in the, in the Q&A uh, chat. I, I would like to again uh, thank you all for your kind contributions, your, your very thoughtful, incisive presentation.
questions. And of course, you're very uh, enlightening in responses to the questions that I posed to you all. And now I would like to hand the mic back to our uh, efficient uh, MC to bring the webinar to a close and invite our our our, our guest of honor, uh, the, our patron, Ms. Lee Shan, to give his closing address. Thank you very much. In order, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brian, and uh, esteemed panelists for your interesting, enlightening, robust, and candid ideas and responses. Um, and uh, these discussions included, amongst others, products, systems, processes, strategies, uh, people, and organizations in this rapidly changing and highly competitive, yet promising banking and finance industry in the UAE. So ladies and gentlemen, to round up today's event, I now have the pleasure to invite the chairman of Business China, the patron of UAE SBC, and our former, I think was former senior minister for trade and industry, Mr. Li Yixian, to give his closing remarks. Mr. Li, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noor, for your uh, introduction. and. Uh, Thank you, Brian, for staying up at 2.30 in Calgary. I, I don't know why it's a secret to stay awake uh, in the middle of the night, but uh, I must say this is a, a very uh, interesting and exciting session. I learned a great deal uh, from the various speakers. Um, I think from uh, the various uh, uh, sharing and uh, remarks, um, I, you know, we learn a lot about uh, the banking and finance industry. Uh, which is going through a great transformation uh, for quite a number of years now. I think the industry is hiring more technologies than accountants. Uh, and, uh, and as we see in this panel, we have the traditional banks, uh, you know, going through digitalization. We also have uh, fintech companies, you know, the upstart, so to speak, uh, you know, re-architecting uh, the, the uh, new infrastructure uh, to facilitate the uh, uh, banking uh, and meeting uh, various uh, sectors' needs. Uh, so I am very impressed with uh, the various speakers. I I'm also want to congratulate uh, Dubai uh, and Abu Dhabi uh, for uh, their respective efforts in positioning themselves uh, as a financial center. Um, you know, so through the sharing of uh, Dubai finance. IFC and uh, Abu Dhabi global market, I think uh, their, uh, their ambitions and their, their visions are uh, very admirable. Uh, there's a lot Singapore can uh, learn from them uh, in terms of uh, you know, how they see the future and uh, how th their imagination and what they do uh, towards their goals. Uh, for uh, someone like me who, who have uh, worked for work to improve uh, Singapore and UAE's ties uh, for a decade or more, um, I, I'm very glad to see many Singapore companies uh, you know, growing their footprints uh, in the MENA region uh, and also uh, growing their operation uh, with sizable staff and sophistication. Uh, out of UAE and, uh, and the GCC. Uh, I think it speaks a lot about, uh, you know, our, the willingness of our companies uh, wanting to internationalize and view uh, the MENA market as an important and growing market uh, for their growth uh, and international expansion. Um, finally, I would say that uh, UAE and Singapore are seven hours away, and we cover a very different uh, market and region, despite the fact that uh, we are globalized. And um, I think there's a lot we can, uh, a lot of market opportunities we can address. Um, and we can't quite uh, be as effective as, as Dubai, for example, uh, and Abu Dhabi uh, in covering the MENA region. Uh, you know, because you are so much closer to the market and you have uh, access to the talents and networks uh, over at your side. And likewise, I think uh, 
for Singapore to be a good partner for UAE, uh, we uh, obviously uh, cover a good part of uh, the North Asia, South Southeast Asia, uh, Australasia, and uh, we have good access and to both the markets and the talents uh, and and the good vibes, you know, uh, in these uh, markets. So I think it. Uh, makes a lot of sense for two of us. Both are financial center, trade hub, logistic center, uh, to work uh, closely together. Uh, especially in today's context, I think uh, given the volatility uh, caused by the war, uh, disruption in supply chain, uh, fast changing uh, technological landscape, I think uh, if Singapore and UAE uh, work closely together, we can add so much more uh, resilience, uh, maybe even redundancy uh, and stability in the financing, in the financial system, uh, you know, that we, we are each uh, very proud of. So, um, so I would say, uh, you know, the efforts today is uh, tremendous and I want to uh, congratulate the uh, uh, the Business Council for uh, taking this initiative uh, in a series of uh, discussion and today is focusing on the finance and banking to uh, strengthen our uh, links uh, with the UAE. So uh, congratulations to, to Brian and the team uh, of good people in the, the Business Council and thank you all uh, to all the various kind of speakers uh, and all the participants in this, uh, uh, in this uh, seminar. Um, I just want to quote Ali Hassan of the IFC. Uh, he says, you must come to Dubai uh, to see for yourself, uh, you know, uh, what is real on the ground. And I think seeing is believing. Likewise, uh, I was also encourage uh, companies in the, in the UAE to visit Singapore. And uh, all this uh, will... Uh, take place uh, when when uh, Brian organized the next delegation uh, to the UAE. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee, also for your encouraging comments. I'm sure many share your views and uh, look forward to more collaboration, to quote you with good size and sophistication. It makes sense for Singapore and the UAE to work closely together in this industry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the UAE Finance and Banking webinar. And on behalf of the UAE SBC, I thank you for your kind attention and participation. We welcome your comments and feedback via email uh, to contact us at uaesbc.com. Much has been said, much has been done, but much more will have to be done and will be said. An exciting era to be in an exciting industry, in an exciting place, the UAE. Challenging, no doubt, but certainly promising. We hope you've enjoyed today's session and we wish everyone in particular, also in the UAE, every success going forward. We welcome your comments and feedback via email to us. We have to stress, we will try and answer as much as we can. And meanwhile, until our next event, thank you all and stay safe. Thank you.